this module, we want to cover an introduction to assembly language programming, starting with basic instruction processing, how you look at registers that are available in an x86 processor, look at the different data types that are available for you to program, concepts like stack pointers, instruction pointers. We will get to operations and the data operands these operations take. We, we want to make enough progress today such that you can understand a simple assembly language program and maybe write a small one of your own. Okay, so let us now look at an assembly program and see what we can tell from this program. Any program generally has a few basic constructs, variables, functions, conditions, loops. Now on this program, are we able to identify those? So assembly is not an easy language to understand, but once you start understanding it, all the program constructs that you find in regular programming languages, you will be able to identify those here. So today we will be going into assembly program and our goal will be that we actually are able to understand this program, what it is doing. Before we get into programming in assembly, let's understand how basic instruction processing works. And this is a very general purpose model. We have a CPU, and then the CPU talks externally to memory. It also talks externally to IO adapters, but that is not what we will be dealing with today. So the CPU talks over an address bus to memory. The CPU in itself has the ability to process and compute. This is available through the arithmetic logical unit that's inside the CPU. Then additionally, the CPU keeps certain variables in memory within the CPU in registers. So registers are available to keep results stored. So you don't always have to go back to memory and, and registers are available at very fast speed to do computations. So what will a basic instruction processing look like? Well, you will load the instruction and data from memory. So you need something, the CPU has nothing initially. You will process the instruction. You will save data back to memory or to IO devices if that's what you're doing. And then you simply go to the next instruction. And, then, and this keeps on repeating itself. So having this base model, let us now understand how the Intel x86 architecture is defined. So for programming, the biggest construct you have is the registers. And then we will get to the instructions. So in the x86 64-bit architecture, we have 16 64-bit general purpose registers. Now these are general purpose registers because you have uh, quite a bit of discretion in deciding how you want to use them. Before 64-bit, there were 32-bit registers in previous Intel models, and then before 32-bit, there used to be 16-bit. But now with 64-bit, with, with the 64-bit architecture, not only have the registers become all 64-bit long, but there is a new family of registers added, with R8 through R15, so that's eight new registers that you can actually use to program and become more efficient. So it's double the size in this register set, general purpose registers. There are also six 64-bit uh, segment registers. Now segments were there for backward compatibility and to get addressing more in 32-bit mode, but in 64-bit mode, these are usually not used for address pointing. There is one register, which is the instruction pointer, and there is one register where flags are stored, and we will get to these in a little. There are additionally more registers. There is a floating point unit, which comes with, with its own register set. There are eight 80 bit such registers. Now the floating point unit is more for backward compatibility of code, because for the more modern computations, we have the vector registers, which are now 128 bit long XMM registers. So there are 16 of those registers. and, and this is not going to be scope of what we will do, but vector registers provide you a lot of arithmetic capability, adding multiple or uh, doing arithmetic calculations on multiple numbers together. There are other internal registers that are not available for programming, 
but they are still used by the uh, processing unit for debug, control registers, memory management, performance, virtualization registers. And, and so these are generally not what we will use, but we will, as we go through programming, use the general purpose register set. So what can we save in those general purpose registers? Now we have 64-bit registers. That means that we can save quad words. Now one word, just to brush up a little, one word is 16 bits. One word is also two bytes. Two words is 32 bits and four words is 64 bits. So quad means four, four words is 64 bits. You do not always need to use all the 64 bits. In fact, writing efficient programs means you use the amount and the size of the data that you need. If all you needed was to represent a number between a small number that needed 8 bits between 0 and 255, there is no need to use 64 bits. So how do you accomplish that in registers? Well, in the register, you're able to use a portion of the register. When you specify, when you use RAX, you get to use the full 64 bits for the same register. But you can address the same register using EAX, which represents a double word. So then you only use the first 32 bits of the register. You could also choose to use just a word in the register, 16 bits, and then you will name the register AX. If you just need a byte, you will call it AL. And you can also call it AH for the higher byte, the next eight bits uh, as represented here. The convention for naming for these registers is conventional as the new 64-bit registers that were added R8 through R15, they have a slightly different naming convention. R8 is the quad word register naming. R8D is for double word, the first 32 bits. R8W is for word, the first 16 bits. And R8B represents a byte, the, the eight bits. So, so the newer registers have been named more efficiently, it's easier to tell what they indicate. So the same model applies to all the registers in the general purpose instruction set. And if you want to use 64 bits, all the registers will be named as in the quad word column here. And if you want to use just a byte, all the registers can be used by using the 8-bit column for byte or word or double word. The byte for the upper byte is there for legacy reasons, and it's not supported on the new registers, but it is available on the old registers. So, so like AH is available, but there is no R8H available. We talked about the R flags register. Now the R flags and E flags register naming is almost the same. In 32-bit, it was called E flags. It is R flags now, but the 32 bits have not been used out of the 64-bit register. So technically, it still operates just for 32-bit data. Now this register contains bit values used as flags to indicate operation status and system status. Now what that means is you have 32 bits and every bit indicates something. Not all 32 bits are used, but every bit indicates something of a status. A true or false status. Some that are uh, going to be useful to us in programming are the ones below. They are operation status flags used in conditional instruction processing. So one flag is the carry flag. The carry flag is used, uh, the bit zero in the register indicates the carry flag. It indicates an overflow condition for unsigned integer arithmetic. Now we discussed unsigned integer binary arithmetic before, and this one indicates an overflow condition. So the result had a carry or borrow that went beyond the most significant bit in the operation. It, it generally will mean that you are using a data type and it's possibly too small to do the operation that you intended to do. The zero flag is bit six. It gets set if the result of an operation is zero. So if you're going to subtract two numbers and you get zero, the zero flag will be set. 
the sign flag is the sign after an operation to say is it a positive number the result of the operation or did you get a negative number so a a one will indicate that the sign for the number is a negative number an overflow flag is similar to a carry flag except that it's used in a different context uh, and in signed arithmetic uh, if there is an overflow indication then an overflow flag is used whereas in unsigned arithmetic a carry flag is used let's look at the next register here the RIP it is the instruction pointer register this is not available for use as a register to program, but it has an important purpose. So this contains the instruction pointer to the next ex instruction to execute. And that's important. It's the next instruction. It's not the one being executed right now. It's not directly accessible. And the instruction pointer in general will just go to the next instruction until there are none. The only time it goes somewhere else is if you actually were to have a procedure call then the instruction pointer gets flipped to the instruction to the procedures address so then you move from you don't move sequentially when you go to a procedure call you you go to the address of the procedure and when you return from a procedure call then you don't do sequential anymore the instruction pointer gets set to the return address The stack pointer is also a special register and it's automatically updated up or down. It has a special purpose and it makes programming and functional programming easier. So what you what you do with the stack pointer is there is, it's a portion of memory that is allocated to the program. And when you primarily would call a function, you need to save the previous address. Like if the function were, were to return back to you, how do you know where to go back? So the stack pointer is used for that. But the stack pointer is used for more things than just that. It can keep the full state of the caller function because ultimately you have to realize that the same registers are being used by the calling function and the function that is called. So there has to be a way that you are able to, between these two functions, work together and so the caller would save the state of the caller function such that the one that it called is able to then work on the registers and when the function that you called is done with its job you need to get your state back also local variables that a function has they get put into the stack so that's the memory area that you use for local variables too typically to use a stack you have two operations push and pop push is used to put data into the stack and pop is used to move data out of a stack now you can do a push with a quad word a double word and a word basically looking at the data type if you were to push then you decrement the stack pointer if you do a push of a quad word you decrement by eight if you were to push a double word you will decrement by four you push a word you will decrement by two and then you put your word the data at that pointer address similarly when you pop you do the reverse of the push you first read the quad double or single word depending on your instruction that you were using you're doing a pop quad or pop double word or a pop word uh, from the memory location that the stack pointer is at and then you increment it the stack pointer address by the number of bytes you just read so push and pop are inverse operations to each other and they are very simple to work on the stack so whatever you push you pop it out so how do you use all of these together now comes the instruction set and the instruction set has it has several operational categories that that in the instruction set applies to so the x86 processor is a sysc processor which means it has a complex instruction set 
and the instruction set goes across all of these categories and this is for the general purpose computation data transfer binary arithmetic decimal arithmetic logical shift rotate bit and byte manipulations control transfers string operations io operation uh, enter and leave which is procedure calls and flag control so all these have these operations have an instruction and now what we will do is understand some of these instructions in more details and our our goal is such that we can understand our assembly program so let's first start with what is the structure of uh, such an operation so an operation has an instruction and it has data operands so the instruction is acting on data which is provided in the data operand so you have an instruction name and then you have an operand one and operand two but it, it can be just operand one as well in this particular case what i'm going to show is just demonstrate that with the move instruction so move has operand one as the destination operand and it uses operand two as the source operand each of these operands can be it can specify different kind of data as well and there are three fundamental kinds of data that you can use for that you can provide to these operands the immediate operand now this is when you're accessing constant data provided in the code and you could use hexadecimal you know decimal hexadecimal octal binary representations so on the right here we have instructions where you move like move rax comma 175 this will move the source is 175 and the destination is rax so it's it is going to move 175 into the register rax the same instruction could be represented by 175d d stands for decimal here the same instruction could have been written also as a hex number move rax comma 0x af and the same instruction can also be written as a binary representation so this is just to show that you, you can use different representations for the constant in the code uh, but ultimately they will all be constants and they move into the register here the second way to uh, provide a data operand would be a register operand so it's not a constant but the value is in the register so you could write like in the example here move rax comma rsi in this case you will move the source operand is rsi and it's right to left and you will move the data that is in rsi or copy the data into the register rax and also keep in mind this will be a 64-bit copy because rsi and rax are 64-bit register representations the third way you can move is using memory operands. Now, remember we talked about memory, which is outside of the system. You can use the move instruction to move the memory from outside to inside and from inside the CPU unit to outside into the memory. So when we use a memory operand, we use a special indication to show that we are not interested in the value but rather that value that we specified is an address in a memory area and we are interested in getting the data that's in that memory area location so if you look on the right here move rax comma and within square brackets rsi this instruction means rsi contains the address in the memory region where the data value is present and this instruction is going to go to that address value and get eight bytes out of that and move that data set into rx register so we talked about quad but there can be other data types as well so a data operand certainly has a is an operand type immediate register and memory but it also has an operand size now sometimes the operand size size will be implicit and usually that's because of the register name that we use that you can understand implicit 
indicators. Otherwise, you can also use a specific uh, way. You can specify the size of the data in the instruction itself. So RAX, we went through the register sizing. We said the same register RAX in quad word can also be written as EAX. And then you just want to deal with the double word aspect of it. So if you just want the 32 bits in RAX register, the name is EAX. So you use the name EAX. If you just wanted the first 16 bits, then you call it AX. And if you just want the 8 bits, you call it AL. So that's a convention, register naming convention, that also tells the size of the data operand that you're working on. When you use memory, there is no such indicator. So when we work with memory, you have to specify, are you, do you want to read a quad word, a double word, a word, a byte? It can be implicitly understood based on the name of the register. That is the destination, the other register. So if you, and, and so sometimes you don't have to specify because the other register's name makes it apparent what data type you're dealing with. So let us understand these concepts with the examples because they are the best way to understand what we're talking about here. So let's say we have an instruction move AL comma and within brackets RSI. This instruction is a memory address location data movement the memory is pointed by RSI. The memory address is in RSI. But it will only move a byte. And the reason it will move a byte is because AL indicates a byte register, just 8 bits. Now, we could have also written the same instruction as move RAX, comma byte RSI. Because RAX by default would mean 64 bit, but when we specify we are interested on in just a byte from RSI, it'll still only move 8 bits out of that location and copy it to RAX in the lowest byte location. Move AX comma word RSI. This moves 16 bits over a word. Now keep in mind that in this case we provided a word for the memory location as well as AX for the register location and both are fine representations. Move EAX comma double word D word, that's 32 bit movement. Move RX, comma quad word, that's 64 bit movement. Move RX, comma square RSI. Didn't specify the quad word, but it is still going to move 64 bits, which is a quad word. So sometimes it's explicit, sometimes you will specify the data operand, but it's all, always important to know what operand you're working with. So now let us get into specific uh, instructions. Now, just because you can specify data types, different ones, and you can also specify a different data size, doesn't mean that all those rules are valid for every instruction. So in the case of this particular instruction in move, both operands cannot be memory. That's a rule. Source and destination, you, you are moving to a register or from a register. So not, uh, both operands being memory. The destination cannot be an immediate. So when you do move, you're not going to move to a constant. You can move a constant to a destination like a register or memory address, but you cannot move data in a register or memory address into a constant. So that's not allowed. And both the operands must be of the same size. So you're really going to deal with the same size of operand. You can't do an operand mismatch when you do a move. So these are instruction specific rules and, and they will vary instruction by instruction on what you can do and what you cannot do. So now what we will do is we'll go through a few of the instructions and specifically the ones that are used in the sample program. So we understand what is happening there. So the move instruction is a data transfer instruction and we have already talked about it quite a bit in our examples. So it moves data between registers, between registers and memory, and immediate data to registers or memory. And move RAX comma RBC will move data from RBC to the RX register. The second example here, move RAX comma 50 is going to move the constant 50 to the RX register. Move RAX comma 
rcx in square brackets is going to go to the memory address pointed by rcx and move 8 bytes from there into rx. The next instruction uh, example will be increment and decrement. This is pretty simple actually. You can add or subtract 1 using these instructions. So if you increment RDI, example number 1, it will go into the register RDI and whatever value is there, it will add 1 to that. If you do a decrement RDI, it will go to the register RDI and decrement 1 from whatever value is in there. You could also decrement the value in a memory location or increment the value in a memory location. And in that case, you can specify dig and then dvert square brackets RDI, which means you go to the memory location pointed by RDI. You get the double word over there, 32-bit word, and you decrement one from that. Let us look at uh, the compare instruction. Now the compare instruction is an extremely important instruction because all conditional branching that happens depends on the results of this instruction. Compare compares two integers, two numbers basically. And it doesn't matter if these are strings, everything in within the data set is represented as a number. So two numbers, two integers, pretty much means across the data set you can do comparison. Uh, and it does the comparison using a subtraction. So you subtract the second operand from the first operand. And the flags that are set because of this instruction will be used by the next set of instructions that will, will be able to derive those flags and say, okay, so I understand what happened. And here are some examples. Say you have two registered data sets, and, and in this example, we compare RAX to RBX. So we are going to compare the value in RAX register to the value in the RBX register. Now let us say, and, R, and the way the comparison will happen is it'll do an RAX minus RBX. Now if RAX is greater than RBX, the values in these registers, then these flags, zero flag, carry flag and sign flag will all be zero. So, so it'll set those flags to be zero. Now the way you will use this is in the next instruction and we'll just understand the jump instruction or the move instruction, but we will go into the jump instruction. You will then know that Rx was greater than Rbx by reading these flags. If Rx is equal to Rbx, the zero flag will become one. Because when you did the subtraction, you ended up with the number zero. The carry flag will be zero, the sign flag will be zero. If Rax is smaller than Rbx, though, the zero flag will be zero, carry flag will be zero, but the sign flag will be set to one. So when you do a comparison, these flags get set. And then the conditional instructions after this instruction can use those flags to make conditional moves based on the data from this instruction. So let us look at the jump instruction. The jump instruction is one that actually does use those flags. So jump transfers control to another location. You just want to go to some other place, you will use jump. J, the, the base jump instruction does not is unconditional jump. So if you just write jump in some location uh, using a label, you will just jump to that location. And it's unconditional because there is no condition specified to it. There are other jump instructions as well. And one that we will look at is JA. This says jump if above. Now, what above? The previous condition that we did check with the compare instruction is what this above is trying to test for. And it's saying if is jump if above means if the first number was above the second number, means more than that, then that condition is met. And we just looked at the flags that are set uh, in the above instruction, and these will be the specific flags that will be set. 
above will mean there is no zero flag and above will mean there is no carry flag either. J, E, J, Z are the same. They just mean jump if zero. And, and these are simple because zero will be indicated by the zero flag set. If, if that came and zero indicates equality of an operation the reason two comparisons end up with the zero is because they're exactly the same uh, and jump j and z is the opposite of zero and if it is not zero which means uh, the jump flag is zero uh, and zero flag is zero uh, then the jump no zero flag will jump to that instruction now these are just a few conditions, but there is a whole lot of other conditions as well. And JCC, I've just written it as the general way to write a jump conditional instruction where CC could depend on the scenario that you want to test for. And you can get that from the reference manuals for assembly language on what other JXX, JCC instructions are part of a jump. Let us now see control transfer. So control transfer happens, among other ways, through call and ret instructions. The call instruction is used to call procedures. The call will push the current instruction pointer address to the stack and change the instruction pointer to the destination that you have written in the call. The ret is a return from a function call or a procedure call. Now, how do you know where to return? Well, we saved the instruction pointer when we did the call. So the way you return from a procedure, you will pop out the return address of the caller function from the stack. And you set that address in the instruction pointer and that becomes the next instruction that will be executed. And because that's the next instruction, it'll, the, the control will transfer back to the originating call, to the, to the place that called the procedure. So, so examples are call underscore func underscore loop. So you will call a procedure called underscore func underscore loop and before calling you will push your instruction pointer there and the ret instruction will pop the return address from the stack and set the instruction pointer back so that the next instruction is executed is back to the original calling function there are more control transfer instructions syscall and sysret are two important instructions syscall is used to call the operating system call and this calls the operating system and the op and operating systems and Linux will Linux will provide you functions that you can call in the operating system to execute on your behalf. And the way you will call is by making this syscall call. And then there are parameters you pass to syscall to say which function do I want to call and what are the parameters in addition to that that you want to pass to that. Uh, before moving to the system call, it does fla uh, save uh, a few registers such that they are not lost. And the R flags registered is saved. Register is saved to the R11 register such that when you re when you come back from the system call, the R11 register will hold the R flags data, and so all your flags are retrieved to the original condition using this. So syscall, uh, you you call a system call and then the way you will use this call is by providing a system call number uh, in RAX register and then RDI is where you will pass the argument one to the system call. More specifically on how do we make a system call we will deal with it when we get to the Linux part of the uh, instructions. Sysret is pretty much where the system call is complete so the privileged access system will be done it'll just do a sysret and return control back to regular application level privilege wherever you started from. So now let us look at our original program ag again and see what we gained today, what we learned. Can you now identify the following constructs, variables, functions, conditions, loops here in this program? And maybe go to the next step of saying what's happening in this program. I will leave that as a homework exercise to you. Okay. So, what I will tell you though is this program uh, takes a really large number and then starts decrementing down. So, 
So it starts within this example, hard coded one billion, and it'll start decrementing down until a thousand. And when it is done, it's going to exit. How it is internally structured, you need to use the language instructions and understand what it specifically is doing. Now the other thing here is uh, how do you how do you do it? And I've put some instructions here on on how you actually can run this program. Uh, one, you need to compile the source code. And assembly code is really assembly source code. Assembly source code is not exactly what the uh, the CPU runs. It has to be compiled and it gets converted into an opcode. And, and that's in the object file. So the first thing is you use a compiler and I'm using NASM and there is there are others too, but there's two or three popular ones and, and, and you could use NASM for this purpose. And then the first instruction here says use the .asm program 1.asm and convert it into an object file with program 1.0 notation. It's not enough to have an object file. You also want to link it into an executable such that it can be run as a program. That is where in Linux we use LD and that's the linker program. And you pass your object code program 1.0 and it'll give you back an executable file from that program 1. Now you can run program one, and and the way I ran it, I ran it twice, one without it, without timing, the next time with timing. So you time program one, and it gives you uh, how long it took to execute. And what it tells you is that, uh, and, and the time is measured in total time, and then divided, which is real time, and then divided between user and sys time. And these are all CPU times from a system perspective. What it tells you is that, the total CPU time was 0.339 seconds. All of that was in the user time, which uh, we will get into Linux later on. What does user versus system mean? But pretty much for now, you can say that the CPU took 33.339 seconds to execute this program. So is that efficient? Is that not efficient? Let us look at it. So we did almost a 1 billion loop and we completed in 0.34 seconds. And in each of these loops in the program, we had three instructions that we did. So per loop, we really had 0.34 divided by 10 to the power of nine time, which calculates to 0.34 nanoseconds. So in about 0.34 nanoseconds, we were doing three instructions per loop. So per loop, three instructions, we took 0.34 nanoseconds, and that is pretty efficient uh, overall. So when we look at uh, performance, this is how you measure and can calculate performance of a basic program. In the next module on assembly language, you will go into a few more uh, instructions and look at another couple of variations of an assembly program to see how else could we extend this program more in addition to what it does already. Okay, till then.